Welcome everybody. You are listening to the Omni Channel podcast, a podcast from digital marketers to digital marketers. I'm your host Omni Caldegrand and my mission is to help fellow marketers and entrepreneurs to grow their businesses online. So buckle up and let's get started. Today's first episode, I had the honor to have Kirtana with me as my first guest, and she will talk to you about and teach you guys about how to build systems in your business, what are the most common bottlenecks in a business, and how to scale, optimize, and automate certain parts of your business in order for you to get more free time and able to take a step back to avoid entrepreneurial burnout. So let's get into the podcast episode. Enjoy, you guys. Hi, Kirtana. Thank you so much for being here. It's such an honor to be with you and and um, having you on this first episode of the podcast. You've been um, starting out as a freelancer, right? So that was. Can you just tell us a bit more about your journey? Because right now you are working with uh, business owners to kind of have this shift from not being so involved in their businesses and how to optimize, and automate to prevent burnout. So can you just tell me about your journey from a freelancer to how did you get here? Yeah, that's a great, great question. So uh, essentially a quick story would be, I started four and a half years ago as a freelancer mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, started subcontracting work for somebody else being a Pinterest manager. And over time, you know, they passed on their clients because they were pivoting and kept upskilling, kept learning. And that's essentially why we are in the same mastermind. Had to upskill to eventually get to Cat Howell and understand sales funnels, how to automate your lead gen. And it was around here that I still honestly did feel there were information gaps. And throughout this process of upskilling, what I have sort of gone ahead and learned is uh, how to build systems and automations into your ecosystem. And this is what essentially would either make or break a successful business. So, uh, you know, when you're building a machine, you want it to be as efficient as possible. And that is where systems and automations come in. And the simplest way to think of a system is McDonald's. Like the only reason they could replicate it is because they had a system. It was easy for anybody could kind of, you know, just put those two buns together and whatever is required in it. So, yes. Um, so you did mention that you work with with entrepreneurial burnout. Like, how do you define burnout, and what's your like what in your career what you have been seeing entrepreneurs suffering from burnout? Mm-hmm. That's uh, a question very close to the heart. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So what I do see every single day is entrepreneurs start off with the dream of you know this. Uh, business and it's going to be awesome. They're going to be the boss and they kind of are going to be their own, you know, whatever. And the reality then kind of hits them where that's really not the case because uh, they're not just doing the the fulfillment side of it. They're probably doing, you know, all of the other things, which is running the business. And a business is a great teacher. But um, what I do see people get stuck is when you're working so much in the business, sometimes it's hard to get out of the business and see what's really going to help you because you're kind of caught in the swans. And uh, that is where somebody like me would come and help you. And you're probably working 70 to 80 hours a week. And that is no romantic way to run a business because uh, you don't want, you didn't start the business to run you. You started the business. So, you know, you, it could kind of help you have a better life. So uh, my, my goal is to remove that entrepreneurial burn which would come in with the overwhelm of running a business through systems and automations and essentially helping you to run a very efficient mcdonald's kind of a system for your business um before we get into really the the how to and this is what exactly you're you're going to give us some tips as well on just Mm -hmm. how to uh, optimize a bit better and what are the bottlenecks of the businesses um, before we get into that um, if you don't mind we could talk a little bit about this romanticizing of long business hours for some reason I feel like I've been sold that it's okay to work 16 hours a day because struggle is good just everyone does it just suck it up and I just feel like it's such a misconception 
that somehow if you just work 16 hours a day, every single day, then that's a good way to live because everybody does that. So what's your take on that misconception? So uh, that's a great point that you bring about because society does just say work hard, work hard, work hard. And you're probably kind of going to box yourself into that saying, maybe it's me. I'm not working hard enough, which is probably true. But if your hard work is not going to lead to measurable, tangible results, you're basically doing the same thing every single day. You're stuck in the hamster wheel. Just because the hamster runs on the wheel does not make it more productive. So the whole idea of systemizing and automating is to really be able to bring in a team who over time can kind of run your business so that you can slowly get yourself out of the business. And every owner's biggest job is to produce content for their business, at least the online business world. And what really happens with being able to produce content is it's, it's time consuming. And you don't have the time to produce content for yourself. And I I am kind of a victim of this. I would always tell all my clients saying, hey, you've got to put out content then. Never did I have the time to kind of put out content for myself. So uh, the idea is to set up systems for everything from marketing to sales to do you have a CRM? Do you have Mm -hmm. an email list? How many emails are going out? And really slowly to bring you out of the system so that uh, you can really be the visionary of your business because yeah. that is the right way of running a business not working 16 hours a day yeah I think yeah you made such a great point I think everybody can can say that this is exactly what they want they just want something that can run without them being so involved because obviously once you get started yes that's your baby and you want to bet be involved in your business but once you get into that point you kind of just want to step out um, it does sound like a daunting task for any entrepreneur to achieve. Uh, I think you can totally help with just the how to get started with this process of automating, because I think it's just something that right now, oh my God, I need, I need a team. So do I have to have like HR experience? Like where do I get started? So what would you be saying to those people who are just frightened by the fact that they just, it's, it's a huge task to automate and, and do all of that? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So uh, just a disclaimer is anybody who's running a business, the first biggest uh, piece that you must have, which is going to either guarantee your success or failure is product market fit. Mm -hmm. So if you have product market fit, and what that essentially means is you're promising your customer a certain something. And if there is the guaranteed transformation of that, and you have buyers buying from you because you know there is proof of concept you do have product market fit now if you don't have product market fit whatever i tell you is really just going to be a slow death Mm -hmm. and uh, so i'm going to start off with the premise that everybody who are going to listen to the show at this point are going to question themselves and say hey do i have product market fit (laughs) and how how do we determine if you do it is it like how like feedback wise or sales wise, like the numbers are talking or how do we make sure that, okay, what if I don't like, let me just get this out of the way to make sure everybody um, can move on to the next step. Yeah. So that's a great, great question because uh, this is something my mentor Ravi Abuwala says, who is the one who's trained me with the systems. Mm -hmm. And uh, he would always say, uh, if you reach out to people and so basically he says, you must have, some sort of research about your offer before you even sell it. So go out there, reach out in your ecosystem, in your network, in LinkedIn, and try to get a little bit of assessment as to what really is the pain points of everybody. And once you understand that, and at that point of time, when you craft your offer, go back to the same people and check with them if they're willing to pay money for that. And when they are willing to pay money for the offer, you know, which is going to kind of make their life easier, you do have product market fit. Mm -hmm. And so once that is proven, the only step really is to build a system around it so Mm -hmm. that uh, the new leads that are coming in and new leads are kind of nurtured correctly. And then they go into a sales ecosystem and everything is data driven. Emotions are great. Emotions is what really kind of brings you to the uh, assessment that there's a problem, but always verify it with data. Because many times 
I have been emotional about certain things. And when I go back to the data, it speaks something else. Yeah. So two plus two yeah. is always going to be equal to four. So, uh, <laughs> but anger could be variable. Like I could be angry for different things. You could be angry for different yeah. things. I could be happy for different things. So, you know, basically remove the guesswork out of building a successful business. Mm. I think it's so important what you said is to reach out to people on LinkedIn, because I think even to test the product market fit, people would just go to the family and friends and, hey, what do you think? It's a great idea. I think so, too. But I think a lot of people, a lot of people just lie or just like, oh, yeah, sure. Like you go. And I think even that, that fact that just getting that feedback loop and just getting that real time validations where really people put the money behind an idea and a concept and you can really test it out that speaks volumes than your family or friends or whoever you are you know exactly exactly like you could have your mom buy it for you but (laughs) (laughs) you know that doesn't show that you're a product market fit and uh yeah really the money part is what's going to change the game once somebody is willing to pay the money for the transformation you do know this is a problem and you do know there's a market which requires you to solve this and this doesn't have to be a crazy numbers game right you don't have to go after 10,000 people you probably have to just go after 15 to 20 people and you know you'll kind of get the patterns as to what really is their problem and yeah that is how you kind of establish product market fit Mm -hmm. you did mention the problem part that really um business should essentially solve a problem Mm -hmm. um do you think that that really can make or break a business where how effectively they're solving the problem and how much someone can, for example, charge for a problem solution? What is your take on that, the problem solving part? Uh, so I think step one is to really identify the kind of problems the industry mm-hmm. has. And step two is probably go back and talk to them and start with something realistic. You know, like if you are going to be charging $2,000, for your service, is your $2,000 going to come back to the client within a month, within two months? Like, what is the return of investment for them? And if it's going to be one year, of course, they're not going to buy the product. Mm -hmm. But if you can kind of show it to them that, you know, you're probably going to get this in 30 days and 45 days, then it's a no brainer. So essentially, the way you, way I would approach pricing would really be how quickly does the client make this back? The sooner they make it back, the and as people start buying it and as you start having social proof you could always up your prices yeah that's a really good good measurement of um of your services and products um so okay let's move into really the 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 thick and thin of the topic and just (laughs) let's move into to really um the automation and and um the optimization part so you already mentioned your first like type tip on the, the product market fit like what else do you think are important for for someone who wants to kind of optimize and avoid that burnout to do? Okay, so uh, when you look at business, it's going to be a lot of departments that need your attention, right? Mm -hmm. So the first thing as an entrepreneur that you must try to do is stop being reactive, but start being responsive. So what I mean by that is be purpose-driven and what really makes or breaks a business is really sales of the business. Mm -hmm. So you have to always start uh, kind of dealing or fighting the problem, which is closest to the money. Mm -hmm. So once you establish product market fit, uh, do you have enough leads coming in? And if leads are coming in, uh, what is the sales looking like? And uh, if sales are coming through, what is the show up rate? So when you look at the overall thing, the first thing that would come in would be leads. And the last thing would be probably the show up rate. Mm -hmm. So, uh, as a business owner, you're probably going to be like, hey, which piece do I move first? Because it's it's really like a game of chess. Yeah. So uh, yes. the first thing that you must attack for sure is how do I increase the show up rate? Because we're thinking of, uh, you know, small hinges, big doors, tiny levers that you want to pull, which kind of don't take too much effort, but, you know, are compounding mm-hmm. in terms of results. So uh, if you had to just go back to the example I gave you, the show up rate is 50%. Mm-hmm. And you still have people booking in, you have everybody filling out the application, but why is the show up rate 50%? Now, if you could make that 75%, would that increase your close rate? So mm-hmm. that's the first problem you would start tackling. You won't yeah. start from the front, but you start from the back. Mm-hmm. And uh, some problems are a lot easier to tackle 
than the others. Like for instance, uh, sales would be the most complex problem for you to tackle. Uh, you could definitely tackle fulfillment. You could definitely see if you have SOPs for that. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, is what it are SOPs? Really Just for so, so those who don't know. Yes. Uh, so SOPs stand for standard operating procedures. And every business really has SOPs, but most of them don't document it. Mm-hmm. So uh, essentially an SOP is a step-by-step list of the tasks and the order in which you would approach it. Essentially trying to replicate the same results, whether I do it, whether you do it, whether somebody else does it, you know, because mm-hmm. the steps are laid out, a firewall must be able to get what you're kind of doing. And yeah, so with SOPs for fulfillment, then it becomes simpler. So then you could have a Tom who's kind of, you know, managing a few clients. Then you mm-hmm. could have a Lena who's kind of managing a few clients. But the end product really is uniform and consistent. So the first piece of the puzzle, once you have product market fit, is to ensure you're kind of delivering what you're promising, because that's what is going to build the integrity of yourself as a business owner. And, you know, also the way people are going to look at the business. And once the fulfillment is taken care of, the next step really is to um, ensure you're kind of collecting testimonials. There's a system to collect testimonials again, like how many of us do reach out to our clients, even though we have amazing success, you know, find out from them, hey, how is it going? Do you enjoy working with us? Mm -hmm. And if at any point of time they say, you know, it's been great working with you guys have kind of really helped me, then you could definitely reach out to them and say, could you just kind of help us with a case study? And most often than not, when people are happy and they thank you, they're, they're ready to kind of give you a case study. And uh, yeah, so essentially try to have a tiny system around every piece. So, you know, from case studies, you're going to try to get more clients. So it's going to be a, rip, you know, a, a cycle. cycle. Yeah. Exactly. And uh, the more uh, streamlined and efficient your systems get, uh, the better it will really be. So in this situation, I just spoke about the product market fit, which is the offer. I spoke mm-hmm. about the client fulfillment. Mm-hmm. And I also spoke about SOPs. Uh, let's further go down. Like then what happens is once you have all of this, maybe you started off by just doing organic outreach and you started getting few people coming in every day. So over time, what you definitely must do is get a sales funnel because that's like really throwing gasoline, right? And Mm -hmm. that's when you're going to really attract the right kind of people. So when you start a sales funnel, if you don't track correctly, you could be burning money very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I mean by tracking is, uh, are you hitting the standard benchmarks of the industry? Is your click-through rate 1% or 2%? Mm -hmm. And if that is the click-through rate, what is the opt-in rate? And if the opt-in rate is lesser than, you know, 15 to 30%, that's really a bottleneck that you must look into. Maybe it's the messaging. Maybe the ad is not carrying the scent into the landing page. Maybe the landing page is not loading quickly. So, you know, uh, essentially each of these are going to be tiny problems that are going to pop up in a business. Mm -hmm. But having your pillars in place, which is client fulfillment, which is lead generation, which is a sales team with a CRM, all of that is going to help you. And tackling the problems in the right order is really, really key. Mm-hmm. Oh, there's a lot of things you mentioned um, and a lot of great, great ideas. Um, but again, I think for just to go back to the beginning, which was the um, let's establish that the, the you know the product is is validated, the idea is working, um, and you were just talking about the difference between um, the show up rate and. Um, at the fact that people are engaging with the ads, I think something like that. Um, can you just give us, perhaps for the listeners, just to talk about the show up rate? Like, what are those? Can you give us some tactics to make sure we increase the show up rate, for example? Okay. So uh, without questions. going into too much details, just just like yeah, yeah, tiny yeah. things, because you, as you mentioned, if you can just give us. A, time, a few examples of how would you go about increasing the show up rate um, without really going into too much details. Okay, so in the situation that we're speaking about, the show up rate is 50%, which means people mm-hmm. are booking the call and uh, people are not showing up for the call. So uh, the tiniest thing that you could do is check if somebody is calling the prospect before the call and checking with them and say, hey, I'm looking forward for the call today. Will you be coming in? Things like that, you know, Mm -hmm. just adding a few touch points and really 
once I book a call with your agency, how many case studies or how many email flows am I hearing back from you? Like there is this rule where somebody has to consume seven hours of content before they really become a fan of you. Mm -hmm. So have you tried to have the seven hour content in place? Have Mm -hmm. you shared and engaged with this prospect, you know, before they kind of jump on the call with you? Or is it just, you know, a, a hard sell? Because those kind of sales calls don't really go very well. What really helps is when marketing and sales go hand in hand, when they're they're really Siamese twins, your marketing really helps your sales efforts. So uh, in this situation, tiniest thing that you would do is probably start reaching out to the prospects to see if they're going to come and, you know, increase the touch points or reduce the touch points, depending Mm -hmm. on what works, you know, you split test it. Okay. So uh, let's go back to some of the bottlenecks that you mentioned. Um, Can you give us some more, ideas on that like some more advices you mentioned the the whole cycle it sounds like very daunting to start out is this something that even I can do without a team or do I have to have like a whole whole team around me one that produces content one that closes the sales one that handles the, um, the support like do I have to have all those people around me or can I just get started by myself on this whole automation journey yeah, so that's that's a fantastic question. And uh, the reality of it is you all, all of us just have 24 hours a day, right? So the way you use your time should be really, really efficient. And as an entrepreneur who's starting off or probably in their journey, you have to be very capital efficient. You cannot really hire everybody and kind of get them on payroll because you don't know if the business is going to crash tomorrow, right? Mm-hmm. So you want to grow one step at a time. And the way to do that is to really understand that today you have a global pool which you can access. Like somebody sitting in the US can really hire somebody from Philippines and Mm -hmm. start working with them. So the first thing that you must try to do is get a VA and really try to uh, whatever tasks that could be done by somebody else which are not really that important should just be handed over to a VA which could be SOP'd out because then what's happening is a plate full is slowly going to start getting empty. And that is when you can start focusing and adding more quality problems that you can solve as a business owner. And there is definitely a hiring structure. The way to definitely hire is start off with a VA. And you know, there's two parts to it. As an entrepreneur, there is you running your business and there's also you running your personal life. Mm -hmm. So how much of your personal life is something that you're kind of putting time into? Are you preparing your meals? Are you uh, spending time doing the laundry? Can you outsource all of this, you know, somewhere else where it's cheaper? So you could really optimize the way you're using your time and slowly start hiring up uh, for lead generation. And sales is something that's the last part that you should ever outsource. Because Why do you uh, think it's that? Why do you think you should keep that? uh, You should really keep that because... uh, As a business owner, you're going to be the most passionate about your business. Mm -hmm. And uh, the passion obviously is going to shine through in your voice when you take the sales calls. And if you were to outsource that too quickly, two things could happen. If you don't fix your lead problem and you're going to get a sales rep, uh, say they have leads, they have five leads in five Mm -hmm. days, which, and they don't really close any. So they don't really have the interest to stay on because most of the sales reps we bring on are commission based. Hmm. And the only way you can bring in sales is when you have enough quality leads coming in. So when you don't have quality leads coming in, getting a salesperson is further going to reduce your chances and probably going to be a burden because at that point, you can't really measure, hey, is it the salesperson who's growing up or is it my lead quality? You don't know. Yeah. Exactly. So until you have a steady pipeline, don't worry about that. Okay. So you were saying that um, there are some tasks that definitely need to be delegated to a virtual assistant. And we can talk about, we don't have to go into details where to find them. I think it's very easy for anyone to Google and just find a virtual assistant nowadays. Um, But you did say that the sales is the last thing that you should ever hand over and you should keep holding on to it until you really have everything figured out. So so you were saying that, so what are the tasks that are in in a business like agency, let's just talk about like a normal digital marketing Mm -hmm. agency. Like what are the tasks that you say, Oh, that is definitely something that you need to outsource, or does it definitely need to keep? Not just the sales, like just as a beginner, what are the tasks that you would, how, and how do you f- like pick and choose um, what tasks you're delegating what, and to what you're keeping to yourself? 
Mm-hmm. Another great question. So, uh, like you said, sales is the last one that you're going to delegate. I would try to keep lead generation in house as much as possible mm-hmm. because uh, if you were to outsource lead gen and you can't measure the quality of leads, again, you're going to be burning money very quickly. So, try to keep your lead gen in house and try to focus on one platform at a time. Like instead of trying to throw money into YouTube, into Facebook, into Google, all at the mm-hmm. same time, just try to see if there is organic organic strategies that you can kind of get your clients from this could be upwork this could be email marketing cold email this could be uh, you know prospecting on linkedin so really start off there try to get to a certain level i'm talking about a really beginner here and mm-hmm. uh, yeah so once you kind of have all of that in place then it's really about getting your sales funnel in, into order mm-hmm. and kind of then ramping that piece of the puzzle really However, if you are a mid-sized agency and you're throwing money into multiple channels and you have the funds mm-hmm. because you're making 100K a month or 50K yeah. a month, then what really has to be done is measurement. Are you tracking which ad is being, bringing you the highest number of quality leads? And if you're not tracking, then you know you could be burning money very quickly or leaving a lot of money on the table, really. So for a big agency, it's really tracking. And for Mm -hmm. a newer agency, it's really about fine tuning your messaging, fine tuning all of that, trying to get it to work organically first. And, you know, that could be a VA task. You don't have to send messages yourself or a VA could do that. So these are the tasks that you could, a low level, right? Like you could have somebody do it for you because it's the same every day. Yeah. And yeah, so that that, that would be my recommendation. Yeah. So you were saying that for for a smaller agency, it's it's about the smaller repetitive tasks that that you suggest to be delegated and everything yes. that's uh, the funnel or sales that, that should stay in-house. And for yes. like a mid-size or bigger agency, it's better to, um, to, met- to see and how to measure if you have money to spend and just really find out where is the money not flowing yes. in the right direction, right? Exactly, exactly. Because tracking really then plays a big deal because I've spoken to so many owners who don't know what their cost per lead is, who Mm -hmm. don't know what time, you know, what is the time duration for somebody to be a lead to a closed customer Mm -hmm. and what is the close percentages. So, you know, not having these numbers, it's hard for us to make decisions. So having better tracking systems is Mm -hmm. the backbone of your business. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, so yes, Kirtana, yes. Uh, Kirtana, can you um, give us some kind of um, can you give us some kind of problems and solution that you've been seeing in your practice that reoccurring, and maybe we can discuss that the solution for that. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, this is one problem, and I really want you to really understand uh, the method of thinking here, so that you know mm-hmm. you could apply it in your yeah. business. So the idea is, let's assume a client is doing cold email and uh, they have been sending out hundreds of emails every single day and they're really not uh, getting too many callbacks. So usual method would be, hey, email marketing does not work for me. Yeah. Okay, now let's, now let's dive deeper. Let's look at your numbers. Okay, you're sending out 100 every single day. What is the open rate? Is it 1%? Is it 2%? So I think standard cold email open rate should be around 5 to 10%. Mm-hmm. And uh, if you're not hitting 5 to 10%, let's look at uh, what is the problem there. It could be the quality of your email list. Where are you getting your email list from? Or it could be your subject line is not very intriguing. Mm-hmm. So instead of us trying to go and edit out the full copy of the message, which all of us know copywriting is a skill and you know trying to change that each time takes hours of time and trying to kind of fine tune that. That's a big problem to do at one point. So what is the smallest thing that you can change to try to see that there is going to be some kind of, you know, result, positive result or outcome from that. Mm -hmm. So try to test out email subject lines because testing Mm -hmm. a subject line out is a lot easier than, you know, kind of changing the entire body of the email. Mm -hmm. And uh, your subject lines, uh, there's two things, right? One is the subject line. One is the first few lines of the email. Yeah. So you could also ensure that is not starting with an immediate ask. It could be something which is kind of being curious enough for somebody to click on it to see, hey, what is this really about? And go deeper. And then when you get your open rate high enough and you don't have your response rate coming in, then there is a messaging problem. So, 
yeah so the the, the usual method would be hey email marketing doesn't work yeah. so you shut that off and move on but that's not the way yeah yeah i think it's so interesting the way you tackle a problem from really starting to the smallest detail which is okay instead of saying well that sucks that doesn't work and really trying to understand what the issue is i think that takes a different skill set to be that um attentive for the details okay well, let's look at the subject line yeah if you changed it and still not working the opening rate is still not getting higher maybe if it's not a subject line it's the email list or it's the it's a different problem and it's always trying to find it before really going to the extensive work of copywriting a whole new email and spending hundreds of dollars for a professional copywriter to do that when perhaps the email is fine it's just that the email list is not the best or the, the headline or or you know or the opening rate is just it's so interesting to just dissect that i think i, I love the way that you tackle that kind of problem solving part do you have Thank any you. yeah do you have any other like scenarios like that are very repetitive that you see in your practice yeah so uh, another situation would be uh, you have a facebook ad that's running which is leading into a funnel and the funnel is mm-hmm. simple first page is an opt in page second page is an application page where you qualify your lead and third page is a calendly page or a booking page and fourth page is a thank you page so that's a simple structure of the funnel and your lead quality is really bad so what would be the first thing that you would try to fix would it be what, what would you say sorry if what does that mean that my lead quality is bad for those who are uh, it could it could be that those you're getting on calls with don't have the money mm-hmm. it could be uh, you know those you're getting on a call with uh, are not a good fit mhm so it it could be multiple reasons right like yeah. why the quality is bad mm-hmm. so uh, let's assume you have uh, you have an okay so this is the ecosystem and this is what you're trying to do to get leads and what is the first thing that you would try to change to improve the quality of leads without you know putting in too much effort changing the sales funnel redesigning that is again time consuming yeah. you don't want to start there right so go to the basics what is the click through rate of the ad and uh, if you know the ad is the click through rate is less than 1% or 2% which is the benchmark for cold traffic then is it probably the creative which you could kind of change because mm-hmm. changing a graphic is a lot easier than uh, you know changing the entire funnel and you know then going back to it and see if that's improving your click through rate it could also be a targeting issue so you know maybe you're not targeting the right set of people Yeah. So before you go into the funnel which is you know the bigger piece the most move, extended yeah exactly start smaller and you know these are the small changes that's going to make a big difference because you will start seeing your numbers improve as you start making these small changes but it's simple right like the brain thinks anything that simple is is the right way yeah <laughs> So but that is the right way to go about it. Yeah. Yeah, that's really good as well. I think I'm definitely a guilty of that. I'm thinking my funnel is the problem when it's not the funnel, it's it's everything else. It's it's either could be the messaging or the targeting. I think that a lot of people would just run in and just change up the funnel right away and think, "Oh my god, maybe that's why because they're not the quality of the leads are just not the best." I did have a client with a very very similar problem that she was selling a high ticket coaching and everyone who booked a call were just not the right fit and she immediately mm-hmm. wanted to scrape the whole funnel and like I don't know it's just not working but she did get those clicks it's just that it's just not the right click the click mm-hmm. um yeah so in a situation like that that's what you you dig deeper you're like okay you're getting the clicks but you're not getting the right set of people What does that mean? Is that a targeting problem? Are you kind of uh, is your ads to click baity where you're kind of mm-hmm. attracting the wrong set of audience? So you know, just making those tiny changes before shutting the entire system down, mm-hmm. yeah, is what I would recommend as you know, kind of changing your entrepreneurial brain to work that way. Yeah, it's it's always that keep it simple strategy. I think <laughs> I think it's just exactly. simple. I think if you had to describe what you do as just the simple changes make a big difference and and just really having that mindset and adopting that mindset is super super important um do you have any other scenarios that you'd like to share when it comes to 
um, reoccurring problems that you've been seeing? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, this is one thing that I've definitely seen, which would really impact a business financially. Mm -hmm. So most often, you know, remember how we said, you know, sales is the last thing that you're supposed to outsource. Yeah. So um, what sometimes happens is once you figure your lead generation problem, once that is sorted and you're getting quality leads, then your immediate, every business owner's immediate next step is, hey, I've got to get a salesperson on. I'm getting leads. I can't keep getting on the sales calls. Wrong. Mm. <laughs> That's not the way to do it. <laughs> step one is, are there enough sales assets that you've built before you bring somebody on? Mm -hmm. What I mean by that is, have, do you have a bank of call recordings that you know somebody can start off with just to understand what the business is about? Are you using a CRM, which is efficient enough? So if somebody were to come in, they exactly know where the last lead was. At which stage was that? And if you're not using a CRM, you first need to get a CRM and improve your tracking really because uh, tomorrow it's very easy for the salesperson to come and say, hey, the leads are bad. How are mm -hmm. you going to prove that? Right? So yeah. um, tracking, how, what's the close rate when you were closing the sales and how is that going to get impacted with somebody else closing it? And, you know, going a lot deeper as to, so get your sales systems in order before you bring somebody on. And the first step usually is to bring a salesperson by themselves. The first thing you're supposed to do is try to bring a setter. So what I mean by a setter is have somebody call all your leads to pre-qualify them before mm -hmm. you get on the call with them. Because if you were getting 10 leads a day and you had five calls that day, maybe all five are not really qualified to you know, work with you because they don't have the money, they don't have the need. They don't really know who you are. So maybe they're a bad fit at that stage. Yeah. So instead of you wasting your time trying to get on a call with everybody, you could have your setter check if, you know, they're a good fit or not. Mm -hmm. And uh, that basically is one of the hardest lever to pull because as an entrepreneur, you're like, I want to get on a call with everybody. Maybe yes. I can help them. So it's very important to have a curation rate, which means how many your, your curation rate should be really around 50 to 60%, where every lead that comes through, you're not kind of talking to 50 to 60% of your leads because they're not a good fit. You rather spend your time, money, energy on the leads that are going to become customers because those are the people who have money to spend. So get a setter first. Mm -hmm. Once you get a setter, train them enough so that they could kind of become your salesperson. Mm -hmm. Because when a setter is working with your business, he slowly understands what it's supposed to, what it takes to be a good salesperson because they are kind of checking if the leads are a good fit or not. You see how, you know, instead of trying to bring a salesperson straight away, mm -hmm. now you have systems in place. You yeah. have a setter. You're going step by step. So tomorrow when you bring in a salesperson, everything is measured, everything is tracked and nothing breaks, but more business is coming through. Yeah, I think it's such a great optimizing technique. I think even our initial call, I was laughing so hard when you pointed out <laughs> for me because I was just complaining. Oh my God, I'm not sure if my clients are just getting qualified leads and like, how do I handle that? Like, well, I'll just get them pre-qualified. Thank you. Exactly. That was such an easy solution. Um, and it's, I think it's such a great idea what you said about like the optimization part when it comes to you handling the sales calls, right? But then even that could go through initial filtering before, because obviously if you have luckily 60 calls, um, you'd probably get some calls that are not a good fit. And that could easily be filtered if you had an appointment setter who could just contact them prior to make sure that's a good fit. So you're already saving and optimizing your time and not exactly. even getting into a conversation, right? That's the exactly. idea. Exactly. Let's like get detachment out of dealing with, you know, prospects. You're here, you're a business trying to help other businesses and uh, you can't get on the call with everybody because you don't have that time. Yeah. It's about really valuing your own time as well as um, the business owner. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wanted to talk to you about kind of the mindset of going into um, the optimizing, automating journey, because I think a lot of business owners, and I maybe I can speak for, for, for others when I talk about myself, I had a really hard time 
even delegating certain tasks because I feel like, well, I'm the only person who can do that task, you know, and I feel like, well, by giving out, and I think I can talk to a lot of business owners that I feel like they need to stay involved because if they don't, someone's going to mess it up for them. So what kind of like a mindset shift would you be telling those people who are just fearful of letting go because they're just so afraid that it's going to be messing up their whole business? Yeah, you know, that's that's a problem every entrepreneur has. But exactly. So I, I had that too, because I always thought I'm special. Nobody can do it as well as me. So, you know? Yeah, that's <laughs> <laughs> no, yes it's not that you're special but it's it's like you care the most about your business and and somehow no one else can be that enthusiastic right like you are right 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 so you're right but you have to understand as a business owner you have 24 hours a day out of which you're probably going to sleep eight hours which, you know, is going to slowly subtract the number of hours you're going to work out, which is recommended so that, you know, you can run a healthy business. But really, don't start off with the complex tasks. Start off with the easy tasks. You know, mm-hmm. once you have your messaging, having your VA reach out to people on LinkedIn, it's not different. It's not too, uh, it's not too customized each time. It's the same thing. So try to uh, start off with the repetitive tasks. And over time, you also have to bring in a qualified talent. Like if you're going to bring in a media buyer, you're going to hire a quality media buyer. And uh, when you have the money to spend and you price correctly, you can bring in quality talent. And uh, that's when you will be confident about, you know, okay, I can pass on this piece of cake to this person and I know they can kind of take care of it. And SOPs, always have SOPs, document every single thing you're doing so that you're, there is a benchmark of how to deliver mm-hmm, the product, mm-hmm. right? And over time, it's only going to be improving your SOPs. So, you know, the experience gets better and better. Mm-hmm. Um, just maybe it's a, it's a pro tip. Can you give us perhaps um, some ideas on creating SOPs and like maybe a tool or even a software or something where, we, where people can use to kind of manage that part of their business? Do you have any idea for that suggestion? Yes. So uh, I always do believe uh, tools, there's no tool which is going to be as efficient mm-hmm. unless and until you use it. Yes. So you could start off with something as basic as a Google Doc mm-hmm. and kind of just write down what, what are the things that you're doing. Document it every single day for the next one week and see, hey, Audit your day. Basically see, okay, I get up at this time. This is what I'm doing. This is what I'm doing. This is what I'm doing. And Mm -hmm. over a week, you will definitely know, okay, these are repetitive tasks. These could be outsourced. Mm -hmm. And, you know, over time, you'll have your SOP, which is getting fine-tuned. Then you could get a little more complex. Then you could think of, okay, can I put this in Asana? Can I put this in Notion? Can I put this in Mm ClickUp? Because everything, or Trello, all of these are just softwares. And until you're going to use it, it's, it's really not going to help you. So start off with something basic. Don't get, don't make it complex. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think I'm going to take your advice already <laughs> because I'm like, okay, so tell us your secret. Is it a sauna? Like, what is it? <laughs> and you're like, it's a Google doc. <laughs> I'm like, oh yeah, it makes perfect sense. Thank you so much. I feel like I'm going to be like, Hey, Kirtan, I need your coaching because I need something simple. <laughs> Can you tell me what the simple solution is? Because I feel like it's just, you're just so good at just seeing like the obvious, like for us, like it's not because like, oh, maybe it's like a high-end software, like 300 bucks. Right. A month. And it's just, right. oh, it's just a Google doc. Maybe an Excel <laughs> sheet. Yeah. Just put the test <laughs> down and then that's the SOP. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It's like brain overthink. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Crazy um so um can you tell a bit more what you do like what are you doing exactly like how you can help people and and just let them know because it's awesome what you do but it's just super complex as well like like seeing through all the processes so what exactly are we helping businesses with right now yeah so uh that's a great you know i i try to simplify it because i think <laughs> if i can make a child yeah. understand it then it's Massive. easy right <laughs> that is really good <laughs> So at the moment, what I'm trying to do is I am trying to help business owners 
who already have product market fit, mm-hmm. who are in the 50K to 100K per month and who are kind of strapped for time because mm-hmm. they're kind of trying to manage every single thing. I want to kind of uh, become their COO or CTO, kind of try to help them run the business, essentially being the integrator of the business so they could get mm-hmm. back to being the visionary and work on you know the bigger picture things. Mm-hmm. And uh, for everybody else, I plan to start a YouTube channel and I plan to kind of blog around topics like this. Mm-hmm. So uh, I, I am one person. I can't work with everybody. But yeah. what I can try to do is try to help as many as possible. Just by, you know, having this conversation, you probably had a little ideas with, OK, she's right. Why am I complicating this? Yeah. You know, just yeah. just getting your gears moving in the right direction. So for that, they could definitely go ahead and check out my website and, you know, check out the content that I put out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so um just to dissect the two um and talk about okay this youtube channel i think honestly if you ever start a youtube channel it should be keep it simple stupid i think that would be the name (laughs) or something (laughs) keeping it simple with kirtana or something (laughs) just for you maybe i don't know that's a great name (laughs) yeah because it's so i think it's just the tiny tasks so that you really can look at and be like oh my god you're right. Why am I complicating this? I think you you have such a great vision for that and just have the ability to see that and not going into crazy details, right? So I think that that's your superpower. I was just looking at something and like, hey, a Google Doc, okay? <laughs> so that's really, really good. Um, so um, just a pro tip. I think that would be really good if you do that. Um, uh, okay. But talking about your 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 job as an integrator um for businesses you said you are you want you want to work with like 50k 200 so definitely that's a that's a that's a well established uh, business um and and then really make sure that the owner is the visionary and not stuck in the cycle right that's what we're saying yes um and uh, do you really like do you have like a team for that or just you and you for now because that seemed to me like a very hard daunting task to take that on as a CTO or COO um yes yes so at the moment I'm going solo because mm-hmm. I really want to prove that this makes complete sense yes and which is why I can only work with a handful of entrepreneurs probably mm-hmm. it's going to be one or two in the beginning just to uh, find their bottlenecks, help them work on that and, you know, move from there. Mm -hmm. And maybe over time, once I have an SOP of my process, then I could bring in a team to help more people. Mm -hmm. So the idea is, again, not to complicate it, not to try to get five clients and not have product market fit. The idea first is to prove the concept, ensure this transformation Mm -hmm. and collect case studies and then slowly SOP it out and bring a team to help you. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's where I'm at at the moment. Yeah, that's so. Um, I wish you good luck. I think that's a really good thing that you that you're that you're taking on. It's also like a super daunting one. So, so working with you, um, are are you also like this is essentially a consulting role that you would be taking in a in like a business, right? Uh, not so much a consulting role. It's gonna be more uh part of the business mm-hmm. because I'm gonna uh. I'm going to be a contractor in the business, but how an ad agency takes care of the media buying side of it, I am going to be the integrator who's trying to constantly look for the bottlenecks, which are kind of limiting money or kind of wasting the business owner's time. So these are the two metrics always. Does it save time? Does it make money? And Mm -hmm. if the problem does not do either of this, we're not going to look at this problem. We're going to come back to it. So uh, that's the, that's the idea. I feel like every business needs you. Every business needs your integration <laughs> or operational. It's just, yeah. <laughs> I would be like, okay, each business needs Kirtana because she can look at it and be like, okay, guys, we don't need this. We don't we need to remove this. We need to outsource that, I think. Um, yes. So you are taking on a big, big challenge. I think um, if you could clone yourself, I think that would be very beneficial. <laughs> Yeah, central technology gets there. <laughs> yeah, um, hopefully soon. Um, but uh, again, also, um, I wanted to ask you about um, kind of during before that call, before our call, you, you spoke about um, a free masterclass um, that you made for for the listeners that, that they can go 
to kind of get more solutions on the battle bottlenecks of the businesses. Uh, can you talk more about that as well? What you prepared yeah. for the listeners? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, um, like I was talking to you, I I did a video. I was like, it's not the most perfect, but we had this chat as to hey, perfect is yes. just progress. <laughs> it's amazing. I watched it. <laughs> I learned so well, much already. Oh, well, that's awesome! That's awesome. You got the early sneak peek. <laughs> yes. So uh, the idea with this whole lead magnet or this masterclass really is to basically help people see what the symptoms are which are killing a business and when you can see the symptom because it's not like flu right it's not like you're going to keep coughing it's not like you're going to be sick it's just going to be ill and yes. when you start understanding oh this is a bottleneck or this is a bottleneck or this is a bottleneck then as a business owner you are more informed as to okay these are the pillars that i'm really supposed to look for in my business if i strengthen this the business automatically is stronger the foundational elements so the idea is to kind of i've laid down 14 bottlenecks you know mm-hmm. that could either make uh, that could either you know make or break your business or really slow down your growth and i would definitely recommend everybody to check it out and give me your feedback really is that a bottleneck that's troubling you and how you're dealing with it if that is what it is yeah okay so listeners go to kirtana's um website we're going to include that in the description i think so everyone can go check it out and just listen to the 12th bottle next um and tell us what you think tell us if it's really something that is a problem for you and uh, what do you think about her approach um also i think um just for the listeners uh because you mentioned that right now you're only taking a limited amount of clients because you want to make sure that once you take someone you really really immerse in yourself to helping them kind of solve the problems um do you still have openings for this month or next month like do you do you still have availabilities to take on clients or you are completely maxed out and just for anyone who wants to to have you to look at their businesses right now mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so at the moment i am looking to work with one or two mm-hmm. so there is definitely that opening and the the reality of it is it's not like a monthly opening of sorts right like mm-hmm. once i start okay. a business it's a recurring thing because it's not like problems are going to show up in jan and not in feb <laughs> <laughs> okay thank you for putting me back to my point okay. no yeah so i definitely do have openings for one or two yes you do okay so it's so um have you thought about like how long does the process of working with you would be like then if it's not like obviously i'm coming from the agency owner where we like do one month two month campaigns i'm like okay do you want to do like three months five uh, but it's like it's a really monthly it's a monthly engagement so that's why i'm like thinking in months uh but obviously you're so right it's not just the problem comes and goes <laughs> it's it's either comes and goes but then it still is a problem right that you need to come in and help solve So how would that be looking like essentially if you started working with an ex company tomorrow that would be like a an engagement right in monthly engagement or like recurring uh, yes. So yeah and that's a great great question so my idea really is to work with a business for at least 6 to 12 months mm-hmm. to really scale them to the next level and if they do scale their problems are going to get better and more improvised mm-hmm. so uh, I want to s- the vehicle i'm going to choose right now is going to be a business which is really looking to grow and has has the same hunger that i have because if they don't want to scale and they want it to be a lifestyle business me going in there is not going to help them but if they really want to scale and that's uh, they want to get the owner wants to get back to being a visionary and not working 70 to 80 hours a week definitely bringing me on will help them uh because yeah i i work in the business they work on the business and timeline wise it's hard because they could be at 100k and maybe in 6 months they could be at 200k mm-hmm. then it could be that maybe we have to come up with new offers to test product market fit yeah. so yeah which is why i really want to blog in youtube about this so it can help more business owners mm-hmm. and uh i don't want entrepreneurial burnout to be the reason you quit your business yeah yeah that's awesome uh thank you for helping all business owners Um do you have like um you mentioned already I think we can wrap this up by saying this but you mentioned already um the fact that you want to work with business owners that are committed to 
um, to change and to grow and, and find out and how to fine tune their businesses to avoid burnout. Um, so that's one qualifying, like for your ideal clients that you want to work with, like you already mentioned the 50 to hundred K a month. Right. And the fact that they, they want to, they need to be on board with growing your businesses and, and accepting the fact that it's going to be a long-term engagement, not yes. just like a quick fix, like there, there's a solution by no. So it's like really in an ongoing six months to 12 months engagement. Do you have any other, um, like qualifying uh, traits that you're looking for in your ideal client besides mm-hmm. this product market, product market fit mm-hmm. and you know uh the 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 price point they are at because it does not make sense to bring in an integrator too soon because mm-hmm. probably the business can't afford it at that stage yes. and there's not too many operational problems to deal with and really somebody who's collaborative in the beginning because I can come in as an integrator, but in the beginning, you're supposed to be my eyes and ears of the business. Yeah. And I, I don't want to change something too quickly to disrupt the business because that's not why I came in here. So in the beginning, uh, every business owner I'm going to work with has to be collaborative. It cannot be that they said, hey, we hired you. Why don't you fix this? It yeah. doesn't work that way. You know, I need you to sit with me so I ca- kind of understand the ropes of your business. So then, you know, you could leave me and then I could kind of take it forward. mm mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, so you need that that collaborative. It's not just outsourcing yeah. you that, okay, you fix it, but uh, really being on board and, and wanting to change that aspect as well. Okay, I think that's really important. And you, know, you really also understand when you get on a call with them, the chemistry that you have. Mm-hmm. Because some business owners are extremely egoistical and they don't want to change. <laughs> really? <anything in that. laughs> you think it's perfect, right? It's already perfect. I don't know what you want to change. <laughs> I know, right? What are you going to do? <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I mean, if they're not ready to change too quickly, it's, it's, it's always a bad fit. So mm-hmm. you have to have the chemistry to kind of, you know, want to change and move to the next level. Yeah. So you're, very, you're also very, very selective of who you work with. It's not everyone. You also want to make sure that yeah. chemistry is there and the right fit. And it, that's your own the qualifi- qualifying process of who you want to work with. Like you're also very selective. I think that's important to be to be selective yeah. with that as well. Um, yeah, because the way I see it is if I'm going to pick a bad business and I'm going to waste my time for them, I'm probably, you know, I could have helped a rural business owner who could kind of move their business forward. And I just wasted my time and the business owner's time. And, you know, this other person just lost out because I couldn't work with them. Um, so I wanted to talk to you about the fact that you said you want to avoid entrepreneurial burnout, essentially. So do we have to wait until we get to that point? Or what are the signs that someone is getting burned out? Like, what do you think are the telltale sign that, okay, I need to have someone to look at this whole thing because it's too much. Like, what are the signs according to you? Uh, the number of hours you're working, are you working on your weekends? Mm-hmm. Are you accessible to your clients 24-7? I'm looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> Don't. I, I stopped. No, I didn't. I'm still, I'm still doing calls in the weekends. But I'm getting better yeah. because I, I'm st- I stopped replying at midnight, okay? I stopped doing that's that. That's great. That, that's a start. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So definitely that. And, you know, uh, you are probably at your kid's football game but you're not at the game you're immediately checking your phone if you have emails or you know is there any files that you must put out that is a telltale sign for sure and Mm -hmm. stress really like do you have trouble sleeping are you are you are you stressing too much are you worried about where the next payment is going to come through I think really you will know because you're probably just going to be so invested in your business and uh, yeah workaholic is not a very good name <laughs> because <laughs> yeah I mean so basically set boundaries and your business is supposed to make you money it's not supposed to drain you out if that's the case get a job mm-hmm. it's gonna pay you more so mm-hmm. when you start thinking like that then you kind of start building your business like that yeah I wanted to say okay maybe if one of your eyes start twitching and like you're losing <laughs> hair that's like a tough <laughs> <laughs> that's like a telltale sign but like yours is so much better <laughs> no yours is better <laughs> for sure for sure <laughs> you know I, I used to have this doll which had that problem so that's really? what I knew so I started pushing and I'm like okay this is good <laughs> 
yeah I don't know it's just like when you are like super <laughs> irritated no one can hey hello come out like I think I'm so guilty of that because my friends are not even inviting me out anymore and they're like I know you're not coming <laughs> <laughs> we call you out it's just we know the answer already I think it's just so bad <laughs> yeah I think you start with 12 slowly move to five I mean okay maybe that's too much start with 11 then move to 10 and move to nine and so you know you'll start slowly being not reachable post five and the reason this is so important is because it plays like if you don't have good like business is a marathon it's not a sprint yes. and if yes. you work 20 hours one day that's going to spill over and you're going to be less productive the next day and how are you going to continue on this marathon if you don't sustain your energy? So, yeah, you got to really conserve and preserve. Yeah, for and I, and I think that was super important when you said, like, just keep those tasks that are the most important in your business and, and try to see where you can outsource. And when you outsource, make sure you start with the smaller tasks and just really trying to build up that confidence of even outsourcing. I think that's for some business owners, that's just a huge step to take right away, right? So I think that mm-hmm. those are super, super important what you said about just step by step and looking mm-hmm. at um, the issues um, and trying to delegate the smaller ones and then slowly do it, go up, scale up. Mm-hmm. Um, do you also do consultations? I wanted to ask you this, like, um, because you said you do, you do this integrating work, um, what if someone just wants you to be not like a long term, but they have one issue, one specific mm-hmm. issue? Can they turn to you and how that would look like? Mm-hmm. I would uh, definitely be open to doing consultations. But uh, where I see a problem with that is, you know, if they are already too strapped for time and they can't execute, that mm-hmm. would be a problem. As long as somebody can execute whatever I'm kind of telling them, I'll be happy to help them out. I'll definitely be happy to jump on a call just to be their business therapist and be like, hey, tell me what business problem is affecting you. <laughs> <laughs> What's business problem you affect with your experiencing today? Yeah. Do you see that often? Do you see that often though, that you somehow went in, given advice and no one did anything about it? And do, how do you process that? Is it like something that frustrates you when someone is just not taking the advice that you give them? Yeah, so I think before I quickly would judge them, I'd probably talk to them and say, hey, what's happening? Like, is Mm -hmm. there something that's not right in your life? Like, is there a pressing family issue, a personal Mm -hmm. issue, really? That's kind of, you know, preventing this action. (laughs) Why are you laughing? (laughs) I just imagine, like, my cat is, I don't know, not feeling well or something. (laughs) <laughs> I just I think in my I had like pressing family issues like my dog is like not feeling good and I don't know <laughs> that's why I'm not doing you know what you said to me <laughs> makes sense makes sense so uh when about how to really Really. So that would be my next question. <laughs> but uh, really, I would try to dig deep. I would try to see, hey, is this really a contextual problem? Like, is it a timing problem? Or yes. is it just that you're lazy and you think this is a waste of time? So uh, the sooner we get to that, it's easier for me to say, hey, maybe you're not ready for change. And usually, you know, it's not that they're not ready for change. People are not ready for big change Mm. like they've built a baby from scratch and the last thing they want is somebody to kind of dress their baby up so Mm. I understand it's not something that you want so that's why I would start off with the tiniest change which is so easy to do and you know it's not really hard it's like one push-up so that's what I'm going to ask for in the beginning and try to get the momentum going rather than you know throw something bigger than and mm-hmm. expect them not to do because I wouldn't do a big task too like the mm-hmm. activation energy is too much so start small and if they still don't do that then I'm gonna be like hey maybe we're not a good fit <laughs> yeah do you feel that I was gonna be like oh do you feel like entrepreneurs lie a lot when you try to dissect a problem and deflecting like well no that's not you know that's not the issue like do you feel like they're they that there, there needs to be like a sense of honesty, like in the working relationship where they are like vulnerable in sharing what are those issues 
and not just be like, oh, I'm good, I'm fine. You know, it's all safe. it's just perfect. And then and the whole thing is collapsing. Yes. <laughs> and in the back. And like, do you feel like that's hard to achieve that kind of like trust uh, with entrepreneurs? Yeah. So this is literally like, you know, going on a date with somebody. So uh, if on the first date, you're going to ask them for the hand in marriage, they're going to freak out. They're going to be like, hey, I don't even know you. Yeah. So you start off small, you take them out for dinner. And, you know, you probably see if you have good chemistry, and then Mm -hmm. you kind of ask for a second date. So that's really the way I would approach a relationship as well. Mm -hmm. I would not uh, come in and, you know, uh, try to win your trust from day one. I, I don't expect you to trust me 100% because you really haven't seen my results. So I would kind of get the first result and kind of build my trust equity with the owner over time so they could let their guard down. Mm-hmm. Because obviously there's going to be that little bit of resistance in the beginning. And I understand that's a human thing. So uh, I don't want to fight it. I want to kind of, you know, uh, swim with the water, swim with the current, not against the current. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah I think that's a really good one that's a good analogy the first date you don't ask someone to marry you <laughs> yeah exactly and then building that trust that that gradually comes and then perhaps they would open up more and get more vulnerable with you because I think without that aspect of being honest with about their business and about their sales and about their situation I think without it you cannot help them right you have to know exactly, exactly. And the way to kind of uh, double check their honesty is if they come back and say, hey, I tried email marketing, that didn't work. So the first question would not be, okay, let's move on to the next thing. I would be like, did you track your numbers? What did your numbers look like? Can we look at that? And if they say, hey, no, I didn't track it correctly. So then I'm going to be like, hey, that's a tracking issue. Can we fix that first? So, you know, start smaller where it's not such a big issue, but they get it. Because I'm logically explaining it to them without saying, no, you're wrong. Yeah, yeah. that's so good. That's so good. So basically, instead of telling them, okay, that's not, that you're wrong, but that you're trying to lead them to the solution by asking questions and then detecting, letting them figure out by themselves. It's not like, no. But you know what someone's claiming? Well, I did everything and it didn't happen. Okay, name me 10 things that you did. Okay, I did like five things. Okay, name the five things, right? And just like, okay, I guess I just did one and that didn't work. Well, like, it makes sense when you go to depth and just letting them figure it out instead of just be you putting them in the blast and be like, that didn't, you know, that didn't work. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, numbers don't lie. You could lie, numbers don't lie. So that's what we always rely on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> that's so true that's so true they can't unfortunately they have to have they're just the fact um (laughs) do you have you always been um working with numbers in your career because you you mentioned a lot the numbers and the figures and how they don't lie and how do you trust the hard data have you always had this kind of approach to look at things logically and rationally instead of trying to understand the emotional part of things Mm -hmm. So I think uh, in the beginning, it's, this is a great question because, you know, it takes me back to when I was, you know, starting off in this entrepreneurial journey. In the beginning, obviously, I made a lot of mistakes. It was not this data-driven. Uh, I was data-driven on the marketing side of it because that's what I was doing. I was doing media buying on Pinterest. And uh, that's the part I was really data-driven, but I was not data-driven on the business side of it. Mm-hmm. And over time, I understood how, you have to just basically take the same skills of your marketing and apply it to your business. Because if you're not getting 1% CTR, you know there's something that there's, there's a creative problem or a targeting problem. Yes. But if you know you have all of you're not making consistent money, what is the reason for that? Money is really a measure of how much, how successful you are in your business or not. So uh, is that consistent? You know, so basically being data driven is what is going to, it's the black and white really of life. Mm-hmm. Like if you, otherwise emotions are extremely gray. And all I'm trying to say is try to make business black and white because it's simple. Business is simple. As long as you're making more money than what it's costing you, you're profitable. So it, it's simple math really. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's a great way to look at it and without getting into the emotions of, yes, but I love this idea so much. Yeah, but the idea is not showing results. so. You might as well try something else, right? 
Um, exactly. I think I remember even um, just because I just had this um, um, thought in my head, I think with Elon, Elon Musk, when he founded SpaceX, they said um, the chance of uh, success was 3%. <laughs> Like right. they calculated the chance of succeeding of the company, and that was three percent. And even going to the business, knowing that you have three percent to succeed, is very very ballsy. But it did work out. So, so do you think that because sometimes, even though there are hard data, that could still be a chance of things working out at the end? Like, what is your take on that? Uh, for sure, for sure, because uh, we are in the online business world and definitely with COVID and everything, everything's moving more and more online. Mm -hmm. So uh, whenever I'm speaking about anybody with, you know, being an integrator, I always am thinking about the online business world mm -hmm. and really the pillars really stay the same. So yeah. if I were to apply everything I know to an offline business, mm -hmm. maybe I could help them in a few areas, but not really mm -hmm. scale because an offline business can only take so many customers. So uh, there is definitely clear indicators with how successful you're going to be. Mm -hmm. You can look out and see, are there other people selling the service? Are they making money? And SpaceX is one of a kind, right? Like there's no other business for SpaceX to kind of compare against. Yes. But... Uh, all of our businesses are not that unique, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So it's easier for us to get a little more data and starting point. But uh, only thing that's important is product market fit. Like if you can identify that your offer is going to make, essentially go back and solve people's problems. Like yes. Zig Ziglar says, yes. right? If you provide value to enough people, enough people will value you. Mm -hmm. So uh, really solve problems. That's what people pay money for. Mm -hmm. Um. um I wanted to ask you about, uh, because you, you are in the digital marketing space, and I think if, if you could un, uh, agree with me, this space is extremely, it's moving extremely fast. Like it's really hard to keep track of the new trends and, and everything is moving so fast. Um, like what do you do to kind of keep up with the trends? And what do you think where the future is headed, especially with Facebook? Because I've been, hearing people oh yeah Facebook is that you know and moving into different platforms like what do you think about that as far as the future goes or in digital marketing space mm -hmm. so uh, to answer the first part of your question uh, the way to kind of keep in check with trends is to obviously invest in programs with good masterminds mm -hmm. so you have other people in the same space and you could always verify what's really coming up what's not coming up and also kind of just follow uh, the platform's blog like Facebook has their own uh, information center where you could kind of dig in to see what they're up to, uh, which really are signals as to where the platform is heading. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know if Facebook is going to die because a lot of businesses are still making a lot of money from it. Yes. So yes. the ones who are probably seeing this are people who are not making money from Facebook. Mm. So <laughs> yeah, don't pay attention to them. And uh I, I, I think where this is going to go, I recently, I, I think just today I read an announcement by Mark Zuckerberg where he wants to launch something called Metaverse, which mm -hmm. really is the virtual reality side of things where I could <clears throat> really be having lunch with my friends together with my, you know, glasses. So oh. uh, Black Mirror is getting real. <laughs> yeah, that's scary. That's I have to look that trend up, like that, that idea up because that's just, I'm, I haven't heard of it, but. Exactly. It sounds like a Black Mirror episode. Yes, definitely. Exactly, right? Like he wants to have offers there. People could buy stuff. People could go dancing. People could go on dates. Essentially, this is, he says, inspired from the pandemic because people are not stepping out. Mm -hmm. But uh, I don't know where it's going to go. So, like, Facebook is either trying to make things work or they're trying to buy businesses which are making it work. So, yeah, Facebook true. is here to stay. And the foundations of business really stay the same. Uh, Kind of grab the people who are your customers through attention, bring them into your ecosystem, and then, you know, uh, give them an opt-in. It, it's very simple. The basics stay the same, but it's only the platform which changes. And that is something you don't have to worry too much about, at least at this stage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, I think we can just start wrapping up soon. Um, but what would be one piece of advice that you would give to that burnout that struggling business owner right now, just 
where to start? Like, what would be that? Would that be what would that advice be? If could uh, give that. This, okay, that's a great question. It's a thinker for sure. So, uh, it's really hard. So, what what really worked for me when I was really stressing was I think uh, you have to start having more preventive approaches. Mm-hmm. Like, I started meditating, and that made a huge difference for me. And I've been meditating for over a year and now I started doing psychotherapy thanks to you. Mm -hmm. So uh, have healthy practices. If uh, it's very hard when you're in the loop to kind of break away from it. But however, if you're in the loop, reach out for help. If it's too difficult for you to handle, talk to a therapist, talk to somebody else. Uh, Be part of a good mastermind where you can reach out to coaches and ask them questions if you're stuck. Because these are people who already kind of walked Uh, the same path and are ahead of you in the game and uh, maybe sometimes just turn off everything and don't respond for two days your business is not going to die your clients are going to understand you could always Mm -hmm. just say there's an emergency firstly just get your footing back yes and once you get your footing back then you can like kind of look at your problem in new light but don't go continuously with high stress days that's going to break you sooner than you think yeah, thank you so much. And thank you so much for being here and then having this first conversation with me. I think there was just so much, there's so much value that you've given us and for the listeners as well. And we have to do like a summary of everything um, for people to be able to read as well. Um, do you have, um, do you have a website that you can give us? Um, what's the name of your website? I think you can give us that as well. So uh, or an email that people can contact you if they want to. Um, can you give us just your contact details in general for the listeners? Absolutely. So the website is just my name. It's keetanadevta.com. And uh, my email address is info at gethelpsafetime.com. So my digital agency is GHST Digital, which is Get Help Safe Time. So I'm using the same email address. So info at gethelpsafetime.com. Yeah. And so they can, uh, are they able to uh, book a call with you or did they can email you right away? And if they want to contact you? Right. So currently I do have a booking page on my website. Mm -hmm. So you could book a call with me there. However, if you know that gets taken off or once I kind of find a few good clients, then it's going to be hard. Then maybe it's better to reach me an email. So thank you so much, Kirtana, for being here. Uh, I'm going to leave your email and uh, availabilities and contact details in the description. So make sure that you contact Kirtana. She is amazing. If you need help with optimizing, um, automating, and just someone who looks at your business and tells you exactly where you can do and do better and optimize those part of your business. So just contact her. She, is, she knows her work really well.